So I'm going to talk about this specifically in the context of PMP, but also, but really in the context of peritoneal metastases. Uh, we're going to talk about the technology that, that Caroline just mentioned. We've done some, some studies on this and have some early data to share with you, and we can talk about kind of what, what might, what might uh, be possible in the future with this technology. So without further ado, I, I have no disclosures. Um, I, I'm going to have a little bit of overlap. Uh, Caroline shared her slides with me before, so I didn't want to duplicate her talk. Clearly, she gave a much better introduction to this technology than I can. I am going to give a little bit of background again on the genome and DNA, just because I think it's a, sometimes a confusing topic for myself included. And I think it just never hurts to go over this again. So the genome, when we use the word genome, that just means the entire DNA in, a, in an organism or in a, in, a, in a particular cell. Every cell in your body, in theory, has the same exact genome within it. And uh, it's housed in, inside the cell in these chromosomes. We all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, if you stretched it all out, it's all compacted into the cell. But if you stretched out all this DNA, it would actually be about six feet of DNA per cell. Um, so it's a massive amount. Of, and each cell in your body, you have trillions of cells in your body, it, it, that you can imagine how much material uh, data that is. Um, that puts us just above a fruit fly, but below corn. So I'm not sure where that makes humanity, but that's in terms of the amount of DNA that we have. So that's about 3 billion base pairs in each cell, um, about 20,000 genes. So a gene, if, if you recall from biology days, is actually the part of the DNA that codes for a protein, and that's actually kind of the workhorse of the cell. So that's only 1% of your entire genome. So 99% of your genome has other functions. We used to call it junk DNA, but we know now it's no longer, it's not definitely not junk, it's important. Um, sometimes it has structural components or regulatory functions or unknown functions. A lot of our DNA, we just don't know what it does. Um, so it's pretty fascinating. There's only about 0.1% difference between the DNA of all of us in this room. So we all share most of our DNA is identical. Um, it only takes a very small portion of the DNA that's different to make us all very different and act differently. But it's pretty fascinating. Um, what, what this is very similar. I had this slide before Caroline showed hers. So, I think the, the point I want to make, the first point is that, you know, at, at its heart, cancer is a disease of the genome. Um, there's lots of microenvironment involvement in cancer and the immune system, but at the end of the day, it's genetic changes in a cell that give rise to a cancer, whether that's PMP or whether that's lung cancer or breast cancer, it, it's true. And, you know, over what happens is a cell acquires mutations over time that, uh, that give it the, the characteristics of a cancer cell. They, they make that cell become different than it started out. And that cell then becomes immortalized, and it grows, and, and can spread. Um, and that's what happens. And it's a sequential step of, of mutations. The type of mutations that happen in a cell that cause it to become a cancer are variable. Um, so if you can see here, I think I have a pointer here, right? Yes. Perfect. So you can see here, um, so this top, these brackets at the top are just a single base pair. Remember, there's like this ACTG alphabet that your DNA is, is sequenced, that, that it makes up those four letters. If there's one flip of that, a C to a G or a T to an A, for example, you get a single nucleotide polymorphism. So that's just a single base pair is altered. And that can be enough to have a deleterious effect on the cell. You can have an insertion of a single base pair or a deletion, and that can cause sometimes what's called frame shift mutations, where it actually takes out that entire gene or gives it a different function. And then you can have a segment of DNA that's either inserted, deleted, inverted, duplicated, translocated. So this all happens in the cell's life cycle. As the cell divides and changes, these things can happen, or from damage from the environment, whether that be like UV exposure or some other carcinogen, um, or just, just random error that happens in a cell's uh, life cycle. Uh, these, these, these alterations can happen. And these sequential alterations can happen enough and result in a cancer cell. And this se sequence of alterations has been worked out in some cancers, for example, in colon cancer. Um, we now know that, um, that we, we, we sort of, there's, a, there's sort of this dogma of the alterations that happen in a normal colon cell to, to lead it to become a cancer cell. And so the first gene that's altered is this APC gene. It becomes an adenoma or a polyp. Um, and, then it, and then it can acquire other alterations and become a sort of an abnormal polyp or a, a late adenoma or a dysplastic polyp, you might be called on a pathology report. And then eventually it uh, gets an alteration in P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. That's kind of the last backstop in your, in your, your DNA already has 
has genes that allow it to prevent it from becoming a cancer. But if that backstop is altered itself, then it can become a cancer cell, and that's what happens at the end to become a colon cancer. So this has not been worked out so well for PMP. Dr. Dr. Lowy and some of his colleagues and our group here at UCSD has, has done whole genome sequencing to look at this a little bit in PMP specifically, but we still don't have it well worked out in terms of what sequence of alterations happen to become PMP. But there's probably a similar situation in PMP. Um, so I, I, I think I gave this slide when I gave this talk a few years ago I, on a little bit, it was on the genome, but I always find this fascinating. So, Basically, the whole reason we can even have these discussions today about doing uh, ctDNA technology or just sequencing is because of the revolution in, in DNA sequencing technology. It's really revolutionized what's possible. If you remember back, the Human Genome Project, you know, took 13 years and almost $3 billion to sequence one genome. And now, basically, that same amount of work can be done in a few days for about 1000 bucks. Um, so it's remarkable uh, improvement. This is, there's something called Moore's Law, which is, has to do with processing power of computers, and it basically has to do with how much more efficient and cost-effective processing will become in a computer. It's a computer science concept. DNA sequencing technology has far outpaced what you would expect from a, from a microchip, you know, that Intel might make or something like that. So it's really amazing how much technology has happened in, the la in our lifetime. It's really remarkable. And so that's made a lot of these things possible because we can now sequence a cell's DNA and, and investigate it. So this helps from a cancer standpoint because one, you can just understand the, the cancer itself, just like that slide I showed before this about the sequence of alterations in colon cancer. That can happen for all kinds of cancers and we can kind of understand it better and then obviously treat it. Certainly targeted therapy, as Caroline discussed, you know, that's an, that's a, that's an easy, um, you know, use of this technology. If you have an alteration in a gene that makes a protein and we have a drug for that protein that's altered, then that's great. We can match the DNA alteration to the, to the, to the therapy. There's screening option, you know, there's screening opportunities here. You can detect maybe an alteration before someone's diagnosed with cancer. It's still kind of off in the future, but that's, that's a possibility. Certainly diagnosis is another possibility. You can detect an alteration at the time of diagnosis, help confirm the diagnosis perhaps. And then from a surveillance standpoint, you can um, look at alterations over time to see if a patient's cancer has come back. And so that's kind of the areas that, that this, this technology allows us to do. So I'm not going to belabor this. Caroline talked about this much better than I would. But, but, but I just want to echo the point that um, historically, when we've looked at tumor DNA, we've looked at the tumor itself. We've collected cells from the tumor. And that's problematic in many times. Um, it definitely is invasive. That's where we get involved as surgeons a lot of times, but it's not always feasible or safe to do a biopsy on patients. Certainly, if we're doing an operation for other reasons, we usually have lots of extra tissue we can test, and we certainly do that. But we all, as you all know, we can't do operations all the time. So certainly, it's, uh, it's a challenge. So we often use historical or archived tissue. And as Caroline mentioned, that's many times years old. And that may not be representative of what's actually the most current status of the tumor or of the disease. And so there's temporal heterogeneity, meaning that the tumor acquires new mutations in its lifetime. There's also spatial heterogeneity, because as she showed, you know, if you have one, a whole tumor and you're biopsying one part of that tumor, you might see the alterations in those cells on that one part of the tumor. But maybe you have a different tumor, and PMP has many, many tumors, and we don't know, you know, maybe they're similar, maybe they're different. And so there's some problems with tissue. Uh, testing. We still do tissue testing for sure, but it's just, it, it has its limitations. And so that's this concept of circulating tumor DNA. And certainly from a, you know, perhaps a simplest, more simplistic surgeon's perspective, it's basically just shed DNA, right? And so we, as, as Caroline mentioned, we all have cell-free DNA that lives in our bloodstream. It's rapidly, you know, um, metabolized by our bodies, but it's there. It's there from, from all of our cells, potentially also from white blood cells in our circulation. Um, but, the, but the circulating tumor DNA technique allows you to detect a uh, tumor that could be, uh, that originated from a tumor cell. And so it's a detection and quantification of these variants uh, in the circulation. And um, you certainly, you know, in order for it to, be, to, to work, you have to have a cell that makes an alteration in a, in a DNA, piece of DNA that's then shed in the circulation that can then be detected. So all those things have to happen in order for, the, for, the, for this test to work. Um, but it's very, very sensitive. Because of all this uh, uh, advances in DNA technology, with the modern testing, you can detect essentially a single DNA fragment in a vial of blood, in 10 cc's of blood. 
Um, so, um, uh, you know, and, and that may be among lots and lots of other cell-free DNA that's just normal DNA from your normal cells, but it's literally like a needle in a haystack. Um, the test that's available commercially by Gardent and other, manuf you know, other, other commercial assays are available now, um, they're very, they, they work very well. They're, they're very accurate, they're very sensitive and specific. And so that's kind of where we, we got involved with this. So, you know, the utility um, is, as I mentioned before, if, of circulating tumor DNA, you know, there's implications for, for screening. Um, you know, potentially you could, you could detect circulating tumor DNA before a patient's diagnosed. From a treatment, certainly there's, off, there's, there's uh, applications there in terms of directing therapy, assessing response, and then for surveillance. And this is really what kind of what got us interested in this, because as you all know, uh, PMP is a difficult disease to not just to treat, but also to diagnose and to survey. Um, and so ctDNA has, there's some, there's some application in those areas. So diagnostically, as, as you all know, it's difficult to image peritoneal metastases. You know, it's a patient that has some fluid here, but when you do a laparoscopy and look surgically, you see all these tumor nodules on the diaphragm that you just don't see on this picture. And, you know, it's very difficult to see, to see this disease very well. This patient has ascites, but not every patient has ascites. And sometimes this, the scan looks totally normal, and it's not normal, unfortunately. Um, and so there's diagnostic challenges. There's certainly therapeutic challenges. We all know there's a, there's a fairly high risk of recurrence, despite often our best efforts, and, and sometimes even with, you know, uh, with chemotherapy. Um, and HIPAC or intraperitoneal therapies, there's still recurrence. And so um, there's certainly a lot of advances that we need to do from a therapy standpoint. And then surveillance is also a challenge. You know, you're rendered free of disease, that's great, but we gotta follow you. So then we have to rely on the scans, which are, as I mentioned, faulty. And so that's the concept. All of these things potentially could be, and potentially helped by ctDNA. I mean, certainly don't wanna oversell it, but it's something that, that's what got us interested in this. And the surveillance part of it was really what got me interested in this. And, because we have, we struggle with how to follow patients after, after side of reduction in HIPAC. Um, so, our, so our first aim though, before we got to that, was just to look at ctDNA in patients that were operating. So we looked at all the, a big group of patients that were undergoing surgery for peritoneal metastasis. It included many PMP patients, but not only PMP patients, um, and looked at the ctDNA alterations that they had. And so I'm gonna show some of this data. So we included patients over about a two year period um, uh, at, our, at, at UCSD, and we basically, so any patient that was undergoing surgery for peritoneal metastasis was included. So this included cytoreduction in HIPEC patients, but it also included patients that were getting like palliative tumor debulkings, who we weren't able to remove all their disease, but they were still undergoing surgery. And we used uh, the GARDEN uh, assay for this, we used next, which is a next generation sequencing ctDNA test. Um, the test changed over the time period, so it's now about a little over 70 genes. It, we started it was a little under 70 genes that could be detested, or, or alterations that could be detected. And this would include single nucleotide variants, amplifications, fusions, insertions, or deletions. So they detect various types of alterations, um, if I showed that on that prior slide. Um, and then we quantified the gene that was altered, if there was one altered, and how, what was the quantity? Um, Caroline showed some of the quantities. You know, the quantities are very low generally. There's usually less than 1% of all cell-free DNA is from tumor, even in a patient that has metastatic cancer like PMP. Um, so, but, so we quantified that as, as the percent of the cell-free DNA or the mutation, the MAF sometimes we call that. Um, so that's the quantity. So we detected the presence of the ctDNA and then also the quantity uh, of, of it in the blood. And that's all reported on the test. Um, so we included 80 patients in our initial pass uh, with this, and you can see the kind of demographic information here. It's pretty evenly divided, a little more women than men. The procedures that we did on these patients uh, included these, uh, you know, two-thirds of them were patients that underwent cytoreduction HIPEC, but then the rest essentially got palliative debulking. One patient was a colectomy patient for a recurrence. Um, and then uh, a complete cytoreduction, meaning that we remove all gross disease happened in almost half of patients, 41%. Um, and um, you can see here, this is some of the data from the ctDNA alterations. Of all patients, all 80 patients, of almost 40% had an alteration. So we, did, we, we drew the ctDNA sample before surgery. So this was at baseline, or when they came to us, essentially, in the pre-op area, or in, in the pre-op visit is when we actually did this. So this is before they had surgery. We saw about a 40% uh, um, uh, uh, patients had an alteration. 
Uh, and appendix cancer uh, overall, it was about 35 percent. Higher in, higher in colon cancer, which has been found in other studies, colon cancer tends to shed a little bit more DNA or have more alterations to detect, perhaps, about 63 percent. And then we also did some other diseases, mesothelioma, and some other cancers that we, we did. But obviously, I'll highlight appendix cancer here. And you know, low-grade carcinomatosis, so that would include most of the PMP patients, you know, about 26% still had an alteration, which we don't think of these tumors, as the low-grade PMP, as having a lot of alterations in their DNA. But about a quarter of them actually had levels that were detectable in the blood, which was encouraging, because we didn't know if we'd find any, actually. Um, and then in the higher grade patients, about half of the patients had an alteration that we could detect. So that was, that was surprising uh, uh, in and of itself. And then we looked at the alterations here, and this is obviously a big, big bar graph here. These are basically all the alterations by gene that we found in this group of 80 patients. So remember, there was about 31 of those 80 patients that had an alteration at all. And this is what we found, and it's listed here by quantity. So the most common alterations we saw were in P53, or TP53 it's called, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and in KRAS, which is a, a, in a growth pa uh, factor pathway, essentially. Um, and then, but we saw lots and lots of other alterations, some of which we never would have expected to see in, in patients that, you know, that these are not normal alterations that are known to be uh, involved in, in some of these cancers. You can see it's, it's also broken up by type. So appendix cancers are, are in the navy color here. And you know, the, 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 the trends are pretty similar for all the cancer types. KRAS and P53 were still the, the, big, the big ones. Um, this just kind of shows a little bit more detail if you're interested. So of the 31 patients, there were 62 total different alterations um, in about 59 different, or sorry, in about 24 different genes. So remember, the test can actually detect different alterations in the same gene. You know, the KRAS gene is a very long sequence, and you can have different alterations in that gene, and the test can actually ferret out where the alteration actually happens, depending on which fragment of DNA is picked up by the test. So it's kind of cool. Um, and then appendix cancer, you know, there's 21 patients, very similar rate of, you know, a median alteration per patient of about one. And then the CT DNA quantity, that percent of, of cell-free DNA is about 0.4% in appendix cancer. And then you can see it for colon and some of the other cancers. So, um, so we certainly had a wide range of alterations and um, the rate, the amount was similar to when it's been tested in other settings, so fairly low amounts. This is also a busy slide, I'm, but the, 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 the take home message here is we also did tissue testing on these patients, right? Because we, we did surgery on them, so we had access to tissue. So we had about 15 patients who underwent tissue testing for these as well by various different platforms um, that are available. And we found all of these alterations. Some of the alterations in the tissue test are not also tested for in the CT DNA panel. So it's not really fair to compare them side by side. But if you look at those that are tested in the panel and then those that we found in, uh, in the circulation, you know, there, there's a fairly good correlation. Those in bold are those that were detected on both studies. And if you look at the patients that had alterations in their DNA uh, in the bloodstream, it's about a 97% concordance rate or so with what we found in tissue. We certainly find more alterations in tissue if we have access to tissue than we do in the circulation. Kind of makes sense. It means that there's not every altered cell uh, you know, sheds its DNA in a level that's detectable, but, but it often does. And we didn't find a lot of different alterations that we wouldn't have found in tissue, but, but, um, but obviously this is a blood test, so that's a big advantage of this. So, so the, the concordance is about 97% between, between them. We then looked at kind of different groups of patients. So remember, this is a big mix of people. Some people had cytoreduction hypex, some had high-grade disease, so it's a very, very wide range of patients that we included. But if you break, if you break up the, the, the amount of the CT DNA by this 0.25% cutoff, we found that those that had high rates of CT DNA certainly did much worse. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve. Some of, most of you have probably seen these kind of curves before. So the, 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 the y-axis here is the, the, the proportion of patients that are, that are free of progression and alive. And then if patients recur uh, or, or pass, then, then it, the, the proportion goes down. And this is over time. And so you can see those that had low amounts of CT DNA seemed to do better than those that had high amounts of CT DNA, similar to the graph that Caroline showed with colon cancer. This was for all patients that included some colon cancer, some PMP, some mesothelioma, et cetera. If you look at the different groups, so these are people that had a complete resection versus incomplete, and those that had high-grade disease or those that had low-grade disease, which is basically all low-grade appendix cancer, 
you know, the trends were similar. It's a little more messy in the incomplete resection group. The numbers get smaller though. So you can see, you know, it's, it's really hard to make a lot of statistical comparisons because the numbers get really small. But there seems to be a general trend across the board that if patients have low amounts of ctDNA, they do better than those that have higher rates. And this is, once again, prior to surgery. So these are ctDNA tests that were done before the patient had surgery. Um, we did a little, more, a little bit more sophisticated analysis. Maybe some of you have heard of this. It's a multivariate analysis. Basically, it means where you put all the data in to kind of a statistical test and try to analyze the individual contribution of each data point. And so we controlled for the type of surgery the patient had and the, the grade of their tumor, because those could be confounding factors. And basically what we found is that the ctDNA quantity, even controlling for those other factors, still was a significant uh, uh, predictor of outcome. Um, the p-value here, we, we call it less than 0.05, so it's a statistically significant. We see a, a higher, this is about a 2.3-fold uh, higher chance of recurrence if you had an, an elevated level of ctDNA, even adjusting for the type of surgery and the grade. So this was, this was, you know, this was encouraging. We certainly think that the ctDNA um, seems to predict the, the recurrence. And so the summary of, of kind of this part of our uh, analysis was, you know, there's certainly a high level of detectable alterations in patients, up to 40%. Uh, with, with peritoneal metastases. Remember, all these patients were people that were going surgery, so they didn't have lung and liver and other widespread metastases. They had isolated peritoneal disease. And including PMP or low-grade patients, about 25%, 26% had alterations. P53 and KRAS were the most common altered genes. We know that. The, the frustration there is those are not ones that we have targeted therapy for, at least at this point in time, but maybe in the future. Um, there's a high level of concordance with tissue. So we found about, you know, similar types of genes were detected by both tests. Um, and, you know, certainly, as, as I mentioned at the end, we found that those that had higher levels of alterating of ctDNA did worse than those that had low levels. You know, the, the limitations of this are, are important to point out, though. You know, it's still a relatively small number of people. It was 80 people total, but 31 of them had alterations. So we're doing most of these analyses in a fairly small group of patients. And it's pretty heterogeneous. You know, this has included people that had different kinds of surgeries. And even, as you all know, one side of reduction is not the same as another side of reduction. You know, sometimes it's a few of the things that we're taking out. Sometimes it's multiple hours and, and organs. And, you know, th it's hard to compare all those patients. So that could in introduce some confounders in this. Um, the other thing I think it's important to mention is, you know, we're, I'm, I'm calling it circulating tumor DNA. Caroline is more careful to call it cell-free DNA. But we don't really know for sure if these alterations are from the tumor cell, right? We're just seeing these fragments of altered DNA in the circulation. We know that sometimes normal cells can, can become altered and shed DNA that looks like a tumor cell uh, or looks like DNA that originated from a tumor cell. So that's a possibility too. So we always have to be careful with that. Now, when we compare it to tissue, we do see a similar profile. So that would indicate that we're not seeing a lot of this. Um, and then remember, this was a single time point. We checked this right before surgery and then did surgery. And so that led us to our next phase of this uh, project, which is to look at the pre and then compared it up to the post-operative uh, uh, blood draw. So we did that. And I, we haven't published all this data, so this is kind of still some preliminary data. We're in the process of doing that now. But we've done it in about, it's about 71 patients that we've tested both before and surgery. It included some of those other prior patients and then some newer patients. And you can see here that uh, there seems to be a difference, certainly if, you, once again, preoperative ctDNA tests, similar story would make sense. You know, we don't see any difference in this separate group of patients. We see those that have low amounts of ctDNA do better than those that have higher levels. If you look postoperative, so we checked a level postop after surgery, so after cytoreduction HIPAC or after debulking, it still seems to be a difference between those groups, but it's a little closer. It's a little more messy, right? These curves are pretty separated here. They're not so separated here. And then this looks at people that have new alterations. Those that have new alterations after surgery that pick up a new alteration seem, seem to do worse. And so, you know, certainly we found, we also did a multivariate analysis of this, and we found that postoperative ctDNA levels actually weren't an independent predictor of outcome. But remember, the numbers are pretty small here. You know, this was 71 people. Not all of them had alterations to begin with. So it's an it's even smaller group of people to compare. And I th certainly think that there is, seems to be a difference here. So I think both the pre and the post-op will matter. Um, but there's certainly some, some reasons why maybe the post-op wasn't as, as strong of a predictor. So that led us into the next iteration, which is what we're 
trying to, to get off the ground now, and that's to look at a more rigorous kind of sequential CT DNA test postoperatively. This would kind of look at the surveillance aspect of this. So look at patients before surgery, at the time of surgery, or, or sorry, before surgery, and then at one month after, and then every, you know, and then periodically after their operation of those that had a cytoreduction hypac to see if we could predict recurrence earlier than, than the scans might or than a clinical physical exam might do it. So, so that's what we're, we're in the process of trying to, to set this up now. And uh, this will kind of help, hopefully help us answer the questions about from a surveillance standpoint, is this helpful? I want to thank uh, everyone that helped with this, so including all my colleagues here at UC San Diego, and then obviously the folks from Garden Health, they helped us with this study. They provided the test for us, so we're very thankful to them to, to allow us to do this. And I will certainly take any questions.